how do you define a good day? Is it one where the sun is shining, the traffic's flowing, you don't spill anything on yourself? Maybe you wake up rested and nothing's hurting too bad, or you feel refreshed and everything just kind of seems to go your way. I guess it all depends on how you define good. The dictionary's definition includes words like pleasant, agreeable, profitable, satisfactory. But the very act of defining something as good requires that we use a standard by which we measure it against. Good compared to what? Today we're at the beginning of Holy Week. And we've just heard the whole story of how Jesus entered Jerusalem with the cries of Hosanna, and later he was condemned with shouts of crucify him. Towards the end of this week, we're going to gather again to celebrate a day that the church has officially proclaimed as good. But to those outside the Christian faith, the name Good Friday must seem like an oxymoron. What could possibly be good about what happened 2,000 years ago? An innocent man who wandered about as a homeless itinerant preacher and teacher <coughs> spoke of God's love and forgiveness, of mercy and grace, was wrongfully accused, convicted, and sentenced to death for no other crime than telling the truth, saying that he was the Son of God. He was savagely beaten, ridiculed, hung on a cross to die while almost everyone he knew abandoned him. Only a few people stayed behind to watch and horror. And he never fought back. He never struggled to justify or defend himself in declaring his innocence. They just kept dishing it out, and he just kept taking it. What's the good in that? The very first time the word good gets used in the Bible, there's something being judged, and it is being judged by a standard. As God created the heavens and the earth, he declared that they were good. But it was in the beginning. What could be the standard that he was using by which to compare them and declare them good? The standard was himself. Because ultimately, only God is good. His perfection is the ultimate standard for anything which is declared good, which is not good news for anyone who is trying to impress God by living a good life. If God's definition of good is perfection, then what hope do any of us have of heaven? <laughs> well, that's what Good Friday is all about. Because in Jesus, the standard is met. <coughs> the book of Romans tells us two very important things about ourselves and about the nature of sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. But when Jesus died on that cross on Good Friday, sin's wages were paid in full. Because God allowed his life to be made an offering for our sin. The punishment that we deserved was put upon him. And oddly enough, we read about it in the Old Testament reading this morning. Prophet Isaiah described with surprising detail that what happened on Good Friday so long ago. And the remarkable thing is that he wrote that well over 700 years before it ever occurred. I just find this amazing. Every time I hear this passage each year, it just it, it blows my mind. I really want us to look at it again. I know you heard Joanne read it very nicely, but I want you to see the words. I want us to kind of walk through it one more time. Isaiah chapter 53. It's one of the four suffering servant passages in the book of Isaiah that describe the Messiah, who the Messiah is. But this is a very unique chap, uh, servant song. It gives the most detail of all four, and it has the distinction of being known as the forbidden chapter. The forbidden chapter. The 17th century Jewish historian Raphael Levi wrote that long ago, when the rabbis used to read chapter 53 of Isaiah in the synagogues, it caused problems. It caused discussion and speculation and arguments and great confusion. 
The rabbis decided that the easiest thing for them to do would be to simply stop reading it. To take that particular portion of scripture out of the rotation of scriptures that were read in the synagogues. That way, that, that's the reason why to, even today, even today in some synagogues, they will stop reading about halfway through chapter 52 and pick up again on chapter 54. They simply don't read it. But it's not forbidden here. That's why I want us to look at it this morning. We have the freedom and the joy and the privilege of seeing it up close and in detail. So turn to, actually I want you to turn to Isaiah 52 starting at verse 13. That's where the, the sermon song actually begins. The very end of 52. Starting at verse 13. <coughs> See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond any human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. God's declaring that his servant will be successful in everything that he does, <coughs> and, and that in his success, it will be accomplished in three different stages. Look at verse 13. It says, He will be raised, He will be lifted up, and He will be exalted. Well, He will be raised, of course, refers to the resurrection. On the third day, He rose again. He will be lifted up is a reference to the ascension. When the disciples were watching, He was lifted up, and a cloud took Him out of their sight. And his exaltation is, of course, the fact from what we heard Jean read in our Philippians reading, that he was given the name above every name. That in Jesus' name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And verse, four, verse 14 describes his appearance when he was put upon a cross, that he was so beaten and tortured, and that crown of thorns was shoved on his head with such force that his... His face was a bloody mess. He was almost unrecognizable. And if you saw The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson, he did a very good job of giving us an image of just how terrible that must have been. It was a hard thing to watch. The first three verses of chapter 53 tell us about the rejection of God's servant, the Messiah. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. The Messiah was to come from the house of David, but the kingly line of David was broken after Solomon. And so it became like dry ground. Yet from this seemingly barren heritage, Jesus was born. And he wasn't an exceptional man by any sort of human standards. Apparently he wasn't good looking. He wasn't a learned scholar. He didn't study with the greatest rabbis. He wasn't exceptionally strong like Samson. He was a simple carpenter. Who came from possibly questionable background. There was rumors, you know, that his mother had him illegitimately. He was very well acquainted with suffering. Those who should have recognized him the best, those who had the clearest and most learned exposure to the scripture should have recognized who he was, but instead they only despised him. They thought he was a nuisance and a troublemaker. They called him a glutton and a drunkard. They said he had demons. They plotted to kill him. They offered to pay anyone who would be willing to turn him over to them. Verses 4 and 6 make it very clear that his death on the Roman cross was for our sake. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. <coughs> We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Think about it. 
Isaiah wrote those over 700 years before that occurred. I just find that amazing. It's remarkable. And, and this is the very heart of the gospel. As painful as those words are, this is good news. Because Jesus died on the cross to carry our sins, to take our punishment, to heal us and to reconcile us to God. Verses 7 through 9. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. The Lord could not be making more clear that Jesus was innocent. He suffered and died for no crime of his own whatsoever. And he bore the suffering that was ours and our pain. He bore it in silence. He didn't try to defend himself. He was obedient to God the Father till his very last breath. Look at verse 8. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Nobody protested. Nobody said, no, this is wrong. Nobody stood up for him or tried to defend him. The whole Jewish trial was a farce. It was held at night, which is against their own law. They had false witnesses with trumped up charges. Even when Pilate said, I'm not finding any reason to do this, they still insisted over and over again, crucify him, crucify him. We want the death sentence for this man. And the detail is really remarkable. Look at verse 9. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. You know, as a convicted criminal, his assigned grave was the trash heap. I mean, the body would be literally dumped where all of the trash was outside of the city like so much garbage. That would be his assigned grave. But instead, a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea offered up his own tomb that had never been used to be his resting place. Our Lord went from a virgin womb to a virgin tomb. Let's look at those last three verses. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We're being reminded that God sent Jesus into the world for this very reason. We love to celebrate Christmas with the baby in the manger. We love all of the miracle stories and the wonderful kindness that he showed to people. But the ultimate reason he was sent was to die on the cross. God took no pleasure in that. He took no delight in his beloved son being tortured and treated so shamefully. But that was the purpose. That was the purpose, and it was out of tremendous love for us that Jesus was obedient to that. For God so loved the world that he gave his precious, beloved, only son to die on the cross for our sins so that whoever believes that doesn't have to perish, doesn't have to remain under God's wrath, but can have everlasting life. We're also reminded of the great victory of the resurrection because how else could he see his offspring? How else could his days be prolonged? It, it speaks clearly of a resurrection. After three days, he rose again so that he could again see the light of life, like it says. And we are that offspring. We're the offspring that he could see. The fruit of his obedience to the Father. For those who accept this great gift of love by faith receive all the benefits of that great, dark day. Forgiveness of our sins. Freedom from the hold of sin over our hearts and our minds. A reconciled relationship with our Heavenly Father, new life in the Spirit, and eternal life when we die. The pain and the suffering and humiliation that Jesus faced were not because God was punishing him. Not because God stopped loving him. It was for a much greater purpose. 
Titus 2.14 says that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself a people that were are his very own, eager to do what is good. That's the message of the cross. That through an instrument of death, God purchased eternal life for all who would believe and receive his son Jesus. If this isn't settled in your heart, if you don't know that you know that you know, that you're a child of God by faith in Jesus, I encourage you, don't let another day pass. This is real. The consequences are eternal, and the wonderful benefits start now. Better than anything you could ask or imagine. So if this is your prayer, join me. And if this hasn't been your prayer, but you want it to be, join me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I believe that everything the prophet Isaiah wrote was fulfilled in your Son, Jesus Christ. Because of my sin, he willingly went to the cross to take the punishment that I deserve. I place my faith and trust in him this day as my Savior and Sovereign Lord. Thank you for this gift of new life. May I live all my days for your sake alone, eager to do what is good and for your glory.